It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas Everywhere you go Take a look at the five and ten It's glistening once again With candy canes and silver lanes that glow It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas Toys in every store But the prettiest sight to see Is the holly that will be on your own front door What a bright time, it's a right time To rock the night away Jingle bell time is a swell time To go gliding in a one horse sleigh are you listening in the lane? Snow is listening. A beautiful sight. We're happy tonight. Walking in a winter wonderland. Gone away is the bluebird. Here to stay is the new bird. He sings a love song as we go along. Christmas tree at the Christmas party hop. Mistletoe hung where you can see every couple tries to stop. Jingle bell, jingle bell, jingle bell rock. Jingle bell swing and jingle bells ring. Dancing and prancing in jingle bell square in the frosty air. Way. All I want for Christmas is you. you. Well, Christmas is such an amazing time. And I'm just so glad that you're here and a part of it. And I think they managed to somehow cram nearly every single Christmas song into that one selection. And it didn't even feel chaotic. I'm not sure about your Christmas, but it seems that Christmas feels chaotic a lot of times with the office parties and family get-togethers and then there's the gift list and then there's the disappointing football games. The whole thing just feels really, really chaotic. But this morning, we're going to focus on the hope of Christmas. And we're going to do that led by Krista and Mel. And we're going to sing a couple of songs that really hone in on that hope. But before we get too far into the morning, I want to stop and extend a special welcome to those of you who are our guests. I know that Christmas time is special, but it can still feel kind of uneasy uh, to visit a church for the first time. And I'm just so glad that you did. And I want you to hear me say that I'm glad you're here. My name is Andy. I'm on staff here. And I look forward to meeting new people, especially as they come to be a part of our service. But in the spirit of Christmas, our guest service team has put together a gift that I'd love for you to take with you as you go. And you can grab that from the studio, which is the glass room you passed on the way in. Uh, you can stop by there as you leave this morning before you head back to the car. So just swing by there, pick up that gift as you head out. And if you're our guest online, you can go to guest.lakeoconee.church and we'll email you something special as well. So we're going to jump right in and keep this morning going by singing together. So if you would, stand to your feet, say hey to somebody near you as our band comes to lead us. The first Noel, the angels did say, was 
Across the certain post shepherds in fields as they lay in fields with a lay keeping their sheep on a cold winter's night that was so deep. No. Like 
singing those Christmas songs, even the new ones, as we begin to learn them, they catch, you know, kind of your ear and you're able to sing along. It's just such a great reminder of what Christmas is all about. But the fascinating thing is that even during a uh, complicated and chaotic Christmas season, even church can feel a little bit chaotic. And uh, we've tried to streamline that for you as much as possible. So over the next couple of Sundays, we're going to continue to lean into the message and the story of Christmas. And they're going to be some really fun services. And then on Christmas Eve, 
we're going to have two Christmas Eve services, one at 4 o'clock and one at 515, identical services. And they're perfect for you, for your family, for your friends. You can invite your kids. They'll be a part of this service. And it's all right. We won't make it super long, so you won't have to wrestle your little ones for too long. But I think it would be something that you'll enjoy and it will be meaningful and still allow you to invest in many of the traditions that you have around Christmas as a family. But that'll be on the 24th, and I hope that you'll plan to save a, a little less than an hour of your time to be a part of that experience on Christmas Eve. And around here, there's so much more that happens than just what happens on Sunday mornings. And I would love the chance to tell you about that, which is what I do in an event called Next. And Next is a 15-minute event, um, but during Next... I take time to talk a little bit about what happens behind the scenes, what happens for your family that you may not know about and the ways that your family can get connected, and I try to field some questions that you may have. And here's the good news. We'll be holding next today during uh, or immediately after this service, and next will be held at that, the studio um, and I'd love for you to meet me there if you're newer to our church or if you have questions. Uh, maybe you're just curious about how our church operates and what happens behind the scenes. Uh, but I'll be holding that in the studio immediately following this service, and we'll keep watching your kids. And I'd love the chance to meet you there if you can spare that 15 minutes. So if you would, go ahead and plan to be a part of that. But everything that we'll talk about in next is connected to our mission which is to inspire people to follow Jesus. And uh, Christmas creates this really, really neat time of year because during Christmas, uh, we can kind of stop for a second and think about all the things that we're grateful for. And in that process, there are times that we're able to stop and think about some of the people that we're grateful for. And this morning, I want to hit pause for just a second to do exactly that. Because what you may not know is that this church didn't just spontaneously kind of come into being, but instead it was the dream and the passion of uh, one family in particular that uh, God kind of put this on their hearts. And over the course of time, uh, they've been a part of watching it grow. But in the course of time, God's redirecting their journey into a next step. And so I wanted to take time this morning, and she's going to kill me for this. But Patty, would you please come up here? And Jim, if you would join her. Um, the stairs are on this side, and I would love for you all to come up here for just a second. They're on this side here. join me here in the middle. Um, so way back, um, as best I can tell, all the way back in 2010, you were dreaming that this could be a thing. Um, and uh, back in January of 2013, our church began meeting in the movie theater because a group of you had said, what, what if we were to rent the movie theater and invite our friends to come and join us? And so you flagged down North Point, got permission to start showing North Point in there. Uh, a bunch of people came, and on that first Sunday, I think there were 17 people in the room uh, that first Sunday on January 6th of 2013. And um, that Sunday, it, it looked like this. If, uh, if you guys have that picture and you could throw it up there, um, that's what it looked like on the first Sunday in the movie theater. And over time... We'll, that group of 17 people turned into people in three different theater bays, uh, kid environments spread across five different areas. Uh, and then we packed it all up and, and came over here and uh, started doing it again, and it grew even more. Um, but uh, what you may not know is that this would not have happened if Patty had not 
been graciously tenacious uh, in reaching out to North Point and, and encouraging them to consider being uh, having a, a location out in this direction, a partner in this, in this location. And Patty, over time, this area has grown. Jim, you've seen it as you've sat in the back of the room. What you may not know is that Jim has been a part of directing these services that you've been a part of for, for weeks and months and years at this point, all the way back into the theater. But what began as 17 people has turned into hundreds of people attending on a Sunday. Um, and there are literally more than a thousand people that say, this is our church. Um, and they'll be here over the course of these next several weeks. Um, and there are groups spread out all across Georgia's Lake Country. We now have influence beyond Georgia's Lake Country down in Houston County. Um, and there, it is so fascinating to see what your dream has turned into. Now, I can't take an individual picture or even a group picture of everybody whose life has now been affected because of the dream that was represented by those 17 people. But what I would like to do is to give you this gift, which is the down payment on the rest of the gift that's coming, because I would like to capture the pictures of each person that has been baptized and said that Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. And we're gonna give that to you in a book that's gonna go with the rest of this gift. Now, the reason I don't have it is because next Sunday we're doing a baptism and in January we're doing three baptisms. So I'm gonna, all of those are gonna be in the book and there'll be a book of 24 families whose lives have been impacted and the ripple effect of those stories, there's no way to capture. But thank you, thank you, thank you for your investment in your heart and your life and inspiring people to follow Jesus through this church. So we talk about inspiring people to follow Jesus. That's what the Posiacs have done. And we are all beneficiaries of that. And uh, so many of you participate in that with your time, in the way that you give. Um, and some of you give in the back, some of you give online. However you do that, thank you for your part in investing in this mission. And uh, we're going to jump into our message here in a minute. And many of you know we do that uh, in a variety of ways to create the most engaging experience possible. And so sometimes that means those speakers are live right here on our stage. Sometimes they're live from a nearby campus. And today we're going to hear from Andy Stanley as he opens up this Christmas season with a discussion about everything that changed because of Christmas. But before we get there, as one of your pastors living here in Georgia's Lake Country, I'd love the chance to pray for you. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the way that you love us. And God, thank you for the way you build us with capacity to love others. And God, I thank you for Jim and Patty and the way that they have demonstrated your love through the investment of their time and energy and blood, sweat, and tears into dreaming this into being and then honoring you so clearly with their lives as it has continued to grow and impact more and more and more lives. God, may we all do the same. And God, as we continue to create open spaces for those who are coming next, God, I pray that we would reflect your love well to those who aren't here yet, but they'll come next week and the week after that. And God, as we look to our own lives to explore what does it look like to, to follow you, um, even through this Christmas story, God, I, I pray that you would open our thoughts and our minds to what that looks like. And uh, God, I pray that in these next few moments, as Andy speaks to us, that you would impact our minds, our hearts, and our world with your message. It's in Jesus' name that we pray.
long live Christmas, right? <laughs> hey, I want to welcome all of you from all over the city of Atlanta, all of our Atlanta area campuses, Southside churches down there, people watching from homes and apartments and uh, people gathered in uh, clubhouses. It's, just, it's so cool to be, to be connected to so many people really all around the country and as we know, all around the world. So Merry Christmas. Um, speaking of Christmas, I, I imagine that most of us have some Christmas traditions that we um, either haven't thought about yet, but we're about to, or we're already gearing up to. Um, certain food, certain per- people make that special dish. You know, we have, we have a couple of those. Um, Christmas traditions around who shows up when, and where do we do this, and how do we do this, and you know, the travel, and just those things that have, have become traditions. And then as time changes, some of those things kind of get interrupted, but we just, you know, you, you love the Christmas traditions. I know we do. So one of um, Sandra's brilliant Christmas traditions that she started when our kids were super young was on um, Christmas Eve, we had pajama night. And the point of pajama night was they would open their pajamas that she wanted them to wear the next day. It was kind of a trick, and they're like, oh, we love these. Well, why don't you put them on? Why don't you sleep in them? And then we'll take pictures in them tomorrow. They never knew what was happening. Um, But then we kept doing it, and this is kind of embarrassing, and there won't be any pictures. We still do pajama night. Like, we all get pajamas, and we do not take take pictures the next morning in our pajamas. Um, The other one that our kids actually started is that the week before Christmas, we have three children, um, two boys and our youngest, Allie, and... The kids would sneak into one another's rooms and take things and wrap them and put them under the tree. <laughs> do your kids do this? It's like, oh my goodness, I have one at this fact. It is the one I have. Anyway, <clears throat> so then the boys one year took this to a whole new level. So this is a picture of Allie opening her portrait that's been hanging in the dining room for 10 years. <clears throat> and she opened it, she's like, I've seen that before for 10 years. Anyway, so you have your own Christmas traditions. Those are a couple that you can steal. Just wait a few, maybe a couple of years and you can claim them as your own. And then, um, I don't know if you, you don't have to raise your hand or admit this, this is a little bit dark, but do you have any day after, like the day after Christmas traditions? Um, We had one for a long time and some of you do this. And as as I just will admit, I never got this, but for years, the women, the, the girls, you know, as we would gather for Christmas, the day after Christmas, they would go to the mall. I know, I'm like, why are we, anyway, and so, and it was kind of, they were together and they'd have coffee and they would return gifts, right, and exchange gifts, you know, which, you know, I I get that. And then online shopping came along and took all the fun out of that. So now here's what we do. We just gather around the day after Christmas and we print return labels. It's so so much fun and go look for original packaging. And I go out in the garage and take all those flat boxes and, you know, put them back together and put tape on them and then we exchange everything. Anyway. Um, and then kind of the darker, darker side, since I'm you know, being a little bit um, transparent, is Sandra and I, for those of you who are into Enneagram, we're both Enneagram ones. So we're, you know, super organized. It looks like no one actually lives in our home, you know. Um, <clears throat> and so, not exactly, but uh, anyway, so we, we love Christmas. I mean, we so love Christmas and we start early. In fact, every year, it seems like we start <laughs> a little bit earlier and earlier. And I'm off for that because we love Christmas. But when it's over... It's over, and I and I hate to even bring that up because we're just getting started. But you know, for, so the day after Christmas, um, we're ready to get back to normal. And I just, I will ask you to raise your hand. Anybody here, you feel like on the day after Christmas, it is time to take down the tree and just let's just get the house. Get back. Yeah, yeah, if you, yeah, godly people like us, I know it's like you just. Because it's kind of, you know, and again, it's a little bit dark, but we, and now others of you, I know it's like go to January 1st, 12 days of Christmas, all that sort of stuff. So it's all, you know, everybody has their thing. There's no right or wrong, but that's kind of our thing. We are just so ready to get back um, to normal. And um, that brings us to what we're going to talk about for the next few weeks, because on the day after the first Christmas, the entire world was ready to get back to normal. Because in an effort to, you know, sort of systematize and sort of modernize and kind of get an up-to-date idea of who should be paying taxes and how much taxes they should be paying, as you know, Caesar Augustus had decreed that the entire Roman world, we have no idea how they pulled this off. I mean, it's, more, it's difficult now to do a census with modern technology. Imagine doing a census, you know, in the first century. He had issued a decree that, the, uh, that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was to find out who's still alive how many people should be taxed and what should our tax base 
be. And the way this worked is that everybody had to go to their, their hometown where they were actually born to register to let the Roman Empire know, yep, I'm still around, and yes, I should be paying taxes, and here's where, what I'm doing, and you know, here's where I live. So if you lived in the town you were born in, this wasn't a big deal, but if you had moved or even some of your family had moved, you had to get up and you had to travel to your place of birth and you had to register in your place of birth. And this was all about you know, raising more taxes, which of course this journey to you know, where people were born is what set the stage for the very first Christmas. But in those days, and this is really important for the next couple of weeks, in those days, there was no Christmas. There was just, honestly, there was just chaos because travel was expensive and travel was dangerous and people we're ready to get home and to get back to normal. But unbeknownst to them, things would never be normal again. Because in the chaos of the census, a child was born. A child whose birth would have geopolitical implications, not for a generation, but for generations. And yet it was like, in some ways, it was like a page out of Greek mythology. It, it was like something that only a storyteller could fabricate. Because with the birth of this child, the divine had come to earth. The divine had become flesh and had made its dwelling, his dwelling among us. And here's the interesting thing, and this is what history has borne out, that every single person, every single person whose lives intersected with this child from the time of his birth to the time of his execution, every single person whose lives intersected with his life would become a footnote in his story. Peasants, governors, kings, and even Caesar. Because unbeknownst to everyone, except for a very small group of people on that night, a king had been secreted into the world. Not a religious figure, that's where we go wrong. A king, a king who would disturb and reverse the order of things. A king who would lay down his life for his subjects instead of requiring that his subjects lay down their lives for him. A king that would then say to his subjects, you are to lay down your lives for one another. And if needs be, you are to lay down your lives and your rights even for your enemies. And he would turn everything upside down and he would do so not as a religious figure, not simply as a savior, but as a, a king. And the kingship or the lordship or the right to ruleship of Jesus is often lost on us. And it's lost on us because of what culture has done to Jesus. But unfortunately, it's lost on many of us because of what the church has done to Jesus. That for many of us, and maybe this is your experience, that, that Jesus has been reduced to, you know, call a friend. You in trouble? Call a friend. I've got an emergency. Call a friend. That Jesus has been reduced to kind of a backup plan, a conscience reliever. How do I get rid of this guilt and this shame? Or even a comforter, a spare tire. But while Jesus' right to rule your life and right to rule my life and right to rule as a king was lost on us, it was not lost on Mary. And it certainly was not lost on Joseph because when the angel appeared to Mary to describe to her the nature of this child that she was about to have, it was none of some of that, but it was certainly more than all of that. Listen to what the angel said. How do we miss this? But the angel said to her, said to Mary, <clears throat> do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God and you will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus, which is the English version of a Latin name that came from a Greek name that came from a Hebrew name, Yeshua, which means Joshua or leader, in some cases, warrior. The angel goes on to say this, and he, the son that you're gonna have, he will be great and he will be called the son of the most high. This was royal language. This was a royal title. He would be the son of the supreme king. And if there was any doubt about his royalty, listen to this. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, Israel's second king. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. That Mary was giving birth to a king a ruler, a command giver, a lawgiver, 
a judge, no mere forgiver of sins, certainly not a mere point of reference, a king. And what the angel says next, what the angel says next is what you see roll out and play out throughout the gospels and throughout the book of Acts and actually throughout human history. The angel concludes with this, and his kingdom, the kingdom of your son and his kingdom will never end. The Greek text, it's a little bit more stilted, but I feel like it's a little more powerful. The Greek text literally reads like this. And of his kingdom, there shall not be an end. That your son will always be a king. He will always have a kingdom, which means Jesus is still a king. And the question that I have to wrestle with every day, and this is kind of the, you know, the, the framework of the template through which I read the New Testament. And the question that any of us who call ourselves Christians should wrestle with every single day. And I mean every single day when we rise in the morning as we decide what our lives are gonna look like, the decisions we're about to make and how we're about to spend our time and our money and how we're gonna prioritize. The question that we should wrestle with every single day that we should at least answer honestly to ourselves and decide maybe especially this time of year, is this question, is Jesus my king? Or if I followed the path of culture, have I followed the path of maybe the tradition of the church I was raised in? And have I reduced Jesus to a conscience reliever? Have I reduced Jesus to someone I call on just in case of emergencies? Have I reduced Jesus to an icon, a cross around my neck, a tattoo on my, uh, my ankle? Have I reduced him to a last resort? And the unsettling thing about Jesus and the unusual thing about the fact that he is a king is this, that he is the king who allows us to decide. He is the king who invites. He rarely intrudes. But here is the gotcha. When you choose or when I choose not to follow the king, you choose and I choose not to participate in his kingdom on earth as it is reflected in heaven. That regardless of what I believe and regardless of what I think about the fact that he's forgiven me of my sin, when I choose not to submit to the king, I choose on that day not to participate in his kingdom in this world. Which means when I opt out, I miss out. And when you opt out, you miss out as well. And you know what happens when we do that? Faith is reduced to doctrine. Our faith is reduced to religion. You'll be a Christian in the modern sense of the word. You will not be a Christian in the original sense of the word. Heaven will not meet earth like a sloppy, wet kiss because those two realms will never overlap. You will say your prayers to an invisible God. You will ask for forgiveness to an invisible God. You'll live your life. You'll live your life even with the assurance that somehow you've been forgiven. But you will miss out and I will miss out on what comes only to those who choose to participate in his kingdom and to submit to his rulership, his lordship, his kingship. So on that first Christmas in the midst of all the chaos, which was actually a diversion, a distraction, a distraction from the main event, a king had been secreted into the world. And it was a perfectly executed plan, perfectly executed. And if not for this sincere, but somewhat confused magi, Mary and Joseph's secret would have remained a secret probably for the next 30 years. Here's what happened. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, we gotta pause here. This is Herod the Great. You don't know much about Herod unless you studied um, first century history, but Herod the Great really was great. Um, he rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem. Um, he was a, an extraordinary architect. He was an extraordinary military strategist. He was an extraordinary general. He was brilliant and he was ruthless. And he was absolutely committed to preserving his legacy and preserving his legacy and his dynasty through his children. 
In fact, his plan was that one day his children would also be kings. The story continues. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. Um, these were probably, best that we can tell, court advisors from different kingdoms, probably from either Persia or Arabia or perhaps even both. These men studied ancient texts and they studied the sky and they studied the movement of stars and they studied the movement of planets looking for divine messages. messages. Now, unlike the song that we sing, they were not kings. That was a third century you know, thing that you know, that's popped up in the third century that somebody just fabricated, third century legend. Um, we don't know how many of them there are. We celebrate the fact that there were three because there were three gifts, but there could have been 30. We don't know. And we don't know their names. And this is really gonna burst your bubble, so you'll wanna come back for part two. They were not following a star, which explains why they showed up in the wrong town. So they travel for hundreds of miles and they show up in Jerusalem. And when they get to Jerusalem, nobody seems to be talking about or concerned about the fact that there was the birth of a king. And so the text says they get to Jerusalem and they ask, that is they ask around and eventually they make their way to the temple. And here's the question that they begin to ask, where, where, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? It was not lost on them that somehow something extraordinary had happened. A king had been secreted into the world. A king had been born and it was a Jewish king. So of course, where did they go? They went to Jerusalem. They're saying, hey, where is this king that was born? Because we saw, this is how we know they didn't follow the star. We saw his star when it rose and we've come to worship him. We saw the star, a brand new star, and we knew this star signals the birth of a king. We believe it was a Jewish king. So they came to the logical place, Jerusalem, and they begin asking around and nobody knows what they're talking about. But word spread quickly. And when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed in all of Jerusalem with him. Why? Well, we shouldn't be surprised. I mean, the birth of a rabbi, hey, lots of rabbis. The birth of a teacher, lots of teachers. The birth of a religious figure, oh, they come and they go. The birth of a prophet, there've been so many prophets. But the birth of a king? The birth of a king signaled regime change. The birth of a king could signal an insurrection. The birth of a king often led to civil unrest or even civil war. And for Herod, the birth of a king threatened his dynasty, it threatened his legacy. And if you know anything about King Herod, he was not one to sit idly by just to see how things worked out so he could respond. In fact, he maintained power for over 40 years because he was proactive, because he didn't just react and he was ruthless. And so he did what he'd always done. But what he does next tips us off to something about Jesus that most of us unfortunately miss. Here's what he did. When Herod, who was so disturbed about this, I mean, a king, I mean, this is a threat. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and the teachers of the law, he asked them where, this is huge, all right? He asked them where, they're looking for a king. A king has been born, the king, you know, has been born in the king of the Jews. He asked them where the Messiah was to be born. So he gets all the religious people, all the smart people, the priests together, and he says, okay, you've heard the rumor, I've heard the rumor that a king has been born, and not only is there a rumor, the stars in the sky have proclaimed that something significant has happened, and it could only be one thing. So tell me, all you smart bookish people, he said to them, where is the Messiah prophesied to be born? Now, why did he enter, insert the term Messiah. They were just asking about a king because Messiah is the title and was the title for God's final king. Messiah is Hebrew for the phrase or the idea of anointed one or the anointed one. The Greek equivalent that shows up in our Greek New Testament is the word Christ. This is very important. Christ is not a name. Christ is not a nickname. Christ isn't just a descriptor. The term Christ is a title. It's the title for God's final king. In fact, the Greek text looks like this. Here's, here's what the Greek text actually looks like. He inquired of them, 
from, he inquired from them where the Christos, the Christ would be born. Not a Christ, the Christ. Where will the Christ be born? Because as they gathered around his table in his, in his court, he was saying, apparently the Christ, the Messiah, the King, the final King, the anointed one of God has finally touched down on planet earth. It's been prophesied. You smart people, you tell me where it was prophesied that this was going to happen. A King, this is amazing. A King had been born, but unlike us, they did not know his name. Now here's why that's important. Unfortunately, and this is nobody's fault, it's just the way life is. Unfortunately, we have allowed, we've allowed the person to define the term. Here, here's what I mean by that. If somebody talks about Christ or Christ, you go, oh, I know who that is, that's Jesus. When you say Christ, what do you, and when you hear the word Christ, you think Jesus. When you hear the word Jesus, you think Christ. Christ Jesus, our Lord, Jesus Christ, right? I mean, it's almost like we've reduced Christ to a last name. We've allowed the person to define the term rather than allowing the term Christ to define the person, because Christ is Jesus' title. It means Jesus, God's anointed one, Jesus, king. A king had been born, but not just any king, the king. Anointed not by another king, anointed not by a prophet or a priest, a king anointed and appointed by God, the father, the creator of all things. Appointed by God to establish, as we read the gospels, and as we read the book of Acts, a kingdom that was not of this world, but it was for this world. A kingdom not of this world, but it was in this world. A kingdom, an upside down kingdom that would be characterized as an other's first kingdom. And Herod suspected it. And he was right to be threatened by it because he knew what we miss. When a king is born, when a king is born, people must choose. When a king is born, people must choose. Years and years ago, um, I ran across this tiny little book. It's really almost like a pamphlet written by C.S. Lewis from some radio talks that he did. It's called The Case for Christianity. It's very difficult to find. Um, it, it's a bit like mere Christianity, but it was radio talk, so they reduced them to this, this very, very short book. And when I got to the end of this very, very short book, what I read had an extraordinary impact on me personally. Because C.S. Lewis, in his creative way, goes to the impetus and goes to the, the focal point of what we've said. It really takes us right to the Christmas story and the idea of the authority of Jesus. And it is, it's challenged me so much. I don't know how many times I've read this, but it's even, it continues to even be emotional for me because I'm like you. It's easy for me, regardless, even in spite of the fact that this is what I do, to reduce Jesus to something less than a king to reduce him to less than something that he came to be. That is so clear that once you hear a message like this, when you begin to read the New Testament, it is everywhere. Every single time a person says Jesus Christ, whether in reverence or without any reverence, they are proclaiming Jesus King, Jesus King, King Jesus. And when a king is born and when a king shows up, people have to choose. Here, here's... Here's what he writes. He says, I wonder whether people who ask God to interfere openly and directly in our world quite realize what it will be like when he does. Because this is, what we want is this. We want God to pss, pss, fix that, pss, pss, fix that, fix her. And I don't wanna get any on me, none of this. Pss, pss, no, no, don't, don't, don't mess with me. Pss, pss, I want you to fix her, I want you to fix him, I want you to fix that. And he asked a magnificent question. Do you realize that God is not gonna come in an aerosol form, that God's not gonna show up in a little bitty space and time and do something little. He says, I wonder if people who've actually read the New Testament understand that when God shows up, what it's really gonna be like. He says, when that happens, it is the end of the world. When that happens, it's gonna be the end of the world. When the author walks on the stage, the play is over. He says, God, he says, don't worry. God is going to invade all right. But what is the good of saying you are on his side then? 
What is the good of saying we're on his side then? He says, what is the good of saying, oh yeah, 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 I'm for you, I've always recognized you as my king. When you see the whole natural universe melting away like a dream and something else, and something else, something that never entered your head to conceive, some comes crashing and something so beautiful to some of us and so terrible to others that none, that none of us will have any choice left. I love this next line. For this time, unlike the first time, for this time, it will be God without disguise. Not a baby in a manger, not a teacher on a hillside, not someone who stops and bends down and cares for the weak and the suffering, not one who seemed to be easily intimidated and avoided certain situations while moving into others and confusing people. None of that, he says, this is no longer a man who can be bound and flogged and crucified. Next time he shows up as king, it will be without disguise. Something, he says, so overwhelming that it will strike either irresistible love or irresistible horror into every creature. Why? Because in that moment, those who didn't choose to follow will wish they had. And he says this, it will be too late then to choose your side because there is no use saying you choose to lie down when it has become impossible to stand up. That will not be the time for choosing. It will be the time when we discover which side we really have chosen, whether we realized it before or not. When a king comes, you have to choose. When a king is born, you have to choose. So here's what C.S. Lewis says at the end. He says, now, now, today is the moment. Now, today, this moment is our chance to choose. And then reaching into something Peter wrote in one of his letters, he says this, God is actually holding back to give us that chance. It will not last forever. We must take it or leave it. On Christmas, a king was born. The question is, every single day the question is, for those of us who believe, is he my king? Is he your king? Have you submitted to the king? Have you accepted his invitation? Don't miss this. Have you accepted his invitation not simply to believe, but to follow? Herod believed. In fact, when Herod had called together all the people's chief priests and the teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah, this God's final king, would be born. And they said to him, well, in Bethlehem, everybody knows this, in Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, it's about six miles from here. We're so close. Then Herod, you know this story. Then Herod called the Magi secretly, just, you know, just however many there were of them and him. And he found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. Why the exact time? Because he wanted to know the age of the infant king. And once he discovered the age of the infant king, he would act accordingly. Because unlike some of us, he believed a king had been secreted into the world. But one thing was for certain, he was not about to bow his knee to another king. He would not surrender his will. He certainly wouldn't surrender his legacy. He would have his way. So he sent them to Bethlehem to discover the location of the birth of the child king whose kingdom it would turn out would not be of this world, but it would be for this world. Because in this king, heaven 
met earth in a way that only storytellers could imagine. That God became one of us to dwell among us. Not simply so we could know we could go to heaven when we die. So that we could experience in this life and on behalf of other people, the kingdom values of God, the upside down kingdom of God, where God cares about the people and God cares about those over whom he reigns and over whom he is sovereign. To come into a system infused and informed by the kingdom values of this world, where might makes right where those with the gold makes the rules, where if you have the power and the resources, you leverage and I leverage my power and resources for my own benefit so I have more power and more resources. And into that world was born a king who came to reverse all of that. And the invitation a few years later was extended and is extended today. Will you follow me? Will you surrender to me? Will you acknowledge me as more than a sin forgiver, more than a conscience cleanser, more than a good luck charm, more than a last resort, more than a call a friend? And when you acknowledge me as your king, and if you do, you will be invited to participate, not simply believe in, to participate in the kingdom of God. And wherever people have taken that invitation seriously, that portion of the world becomes a better, safer place. Because the kingdom values of our king are lived out in such a way that people see themselves through the lens of their heavenly father and their king who came to die for them. On Christmas, we celebrate the birth of a king. The question for me, tomorrow morning when I wake up, start my day. Tomorrow when you wake up and start your day if you're a Christian is, is he your king? And we will pick it up right there next time in part two of the day after Christmas. Heavenly Father, why do we resist? Why do we say no? Why do we power up? Why do we take hold of? Why do we try to control outcomes? Why are we disrespectful to other people? Why do we have to have our way? When in the quiet moments, we know better because we know that's not the king we serve. So Father, this Christmas, maybe would you do something in us that hasn't happened in a long time or maybe never? Would you just break our resistance? and give us the courage to once and for all choose to follow the king. And whatever that looks like with our families, with our money, with our time, our careers, our school, our education, our friends, our entertainment, that we would just surrender all of that because you're the king and you're the king who came with our best interest in mind. What kind of king lays down his own life for his subjects? It had never been imagined before. It had never happened before. It'll never happen again. So give us eyes to see. Give us ears to hear. And give us the courage to follow our King. In Jesus' name, amen. What a powerful question. Do we believe or do we follow? I hope that you'll stay tracking with this series over the next couple of weeks. Plan to come back next Sunday as we dive into this conversation just a little bit more. And I think that you'll find it helpful, especially during this Christmas season. And for those of you who are our guests, please don't leave without swinging by the studio to pick up the gift that we've prepared for you. And if you're newer to our church or just curious, I hope you'll stick around right where you are because next, that 15-minute event where we'll continue to watch your kids down the hall, that'll start in just one minute right here in this room so you can kind of stay where you're at. And I'd love the chance to meet you there. Thank you so much for spending today with us and we'll see you soon. Take care.